Hello and welcome to episode 7 in the Delphi Training Series brought to you by 3dbuzz.com. My name's Buzz. And I'm Logan. And before we get started, I'd like to take just a moment and point out that there is now a dedicated classroom for these Delphi Training videos over at 3D Buzz. If you are watching this video on YouTube, I know you guys are suffering right now because the resolution is quite low. You'll be happy to know that you can download the high-res version of this video over at 3D Buzz in the Delphi Classroom. The link to the classroom is 3dbuzz.com forward slash Delphi. Plus, the classroom is very handy because it keeps all of the videos organized nicely. Plus, there are supplemental videos. And uh, you'll find descriptions and forums as well. Lots of people willing to help out. Now, in this episode, we'll be continuing the development of our simple MP3 player by adding some basic playlist functionality. While the overall objective of this video is to get the playlist functionality working, my goal is to get you guys comfortable with list boxes. That's the big thing. List boxes. How they work, how you can put information in them, how you can pull information out, because in the end, that's where our playlist is going to reside. Now, the playlist functionality that we're going to be adding in this episode is going to be basic functionality. How to get the add and the remove to work and how to actually play what is selected. Things like saving and loading our playlists will be addressed shortly in another episode. So with that out of the way, before we jump into the simple MP3 player, we're going to create a basic application first whose sole purpose is to demonstrate the list box. And here's my thought. If we jump back into the MP3 player, there's already lots of code there. And we're going to have to start rearranging things and plugging new code in to make this list box work. And that might be a bit confusing to those that are, well, still new to programming in Delphi. So I figure if we do an application first that's kind of dedicated to the whole list box structure, if you will, it should make things a lot easier when we jump back into the MP3 player. What do you think, Logan? Well, yeah, in the MP3 player... The list box is just one piece out of the whole MP3 player. That's right. But the list box itself has several different things you need to know about it in order to work with it smoothly. So what we're going to do is take a look at it by itself. That's right. So let me show you what I've got in mind. So let's go ahead and jump over here to my whiteboard and draw. Well, let's see if I can draw it a kind of a square. So we'll start up here. and Ooh, that line's pretty straight. And then we'll do this. I know you guys are going to have to bear with me for just a second here. And we'll do this, and we'll do one more going across, so somewhere right there. And then we're going to, so that's going to be our window. Now, inside the window, real quickly, I will draw out something about like such. This is the list box that we're going to have. You guys have all seen list boxes. You've worked with them in Windows many of times in different applications, I'm sure. Just trying to make this somewhat neat. Trust me in just a minute. Like right now, it's about to get real messy looking. All right, so that's our list box on our window. This is going to be an edit box that we're going to be putting in there. Okay, so now with that in place, now I can get messy. Underneath the edit box, what we're going to do is we're going to throw in two buttons, add and remove. So this will be add and this will be remove. Now, the basic goal of this little application is to allow us to hit the add button and then have whatever information is entered into here then add it up into our list box so we can slowly start to develop a list of items up here. But there's more to this whole thing than just adding and removing. So I'm going to want you guys to see a little bit of what's going on behind the scenes. So we're going to add some information, if you will, right over here to the side. We're going to show you things like, actually, you know what, since it's such a small area, I'll just draw a big box to represent this area. And then I'll put arrows over here. We're going to show you number of items that are currently in the list box. If you guys are confused, just bear with me. This is all going to make great sense in just a minute. Another giant box. These are just going to be group boxes. This guy is going to show you our selected index. Ooh, that might sound complicated. I'll even throw in some basic numbers to get started with. So we've got zero in here. We've got minus one in here. It's going to show us another piece of information. This piece of information, you memorizing the look of this, Logan, so you can build this? 
Sure am. <laughs> this is going to be our selected text. And then we're going to add some something fancy here. Force. And a little box right there that we can type into. And that's going to be for forced selections. All right. So things that we need to do. We need in this application the ability to, let me find where my marker went, add items into our list box, remove items from our list box. I want to be able to count. Anytime I want to be able to find out how many items are in the list box. I want to be able to determine who is currently selected in the list box. So who selected and I also want to be able to go in there and force as well so I want to be able to force those selections that I talked about up there a second ago so these things I want our application to be able to show all of this right here and believe it or not there's not a lot of functionality that we're gonna to have to get in place to make this whole thing works Work, excuse me. So again, a quick overview of the whole thing. I'm going to be able to come in here. I'm going to type something out right here. I'm going to hit the add button. It's going to add information up here. If I come up here and I select something, what I want to have happen, if I hit the remove button, is for that item up here to be selected. Number of items. I want this guy right here to constantly update and show us how many items are over here in the list box at all times. So every time we hit add, every time we hit remove, these two things need to somehow always make sure that this is updated. Selected index. I want this right here. This guy is going to always show me who the index is that's selected. All right, what is the index? Simple enough. As we come in here and we start adding things, We've got the first thing that's added. It's a simple list box. It's a box that contains a list of items. So one, two, three, four. And those items are strings. Okay, so it's text, alphanumeric characters. So there's an index associated. So the very first item is zero. This is the index. Let me write this up here. So the very first one, zero. The next one's going to be one. Next one's going to be two. The next one's going to be three, so on and so forth. That is going to be our index. So we want to know which index is currently selected. Well, that is known as the item index. That's going to tell us which one is currently selected. Oh, by the way, let me go ahead and throw this in. This whole list box that we're going to be dealing with right now is all going to be from the point of view of single selection, not multi-selection. We'll deal with multi-selections a little bit later. Obviously, right now in our MP3 player, you don't want someone to go into your playlist and control select multiple things and try to play all those things at the exact same time. That's not really our goal here, right, Logan? Right, and multi-selection... That's, like you said, it's a future step. Just getting any kind of playlist will get allow us to do one thing, and that's have lots of files in the MP3 player at the same time. That's the goal right now. Exactly. So with selected index, all we're looking at right here is item index. That simply means who is currently selected. What is their index? So in this particular case, let me mark this guy. It's one because I drew the little box around it right there. Then I want to show you guys how we can use the item index to pull out the text. So that if, let's say, AAA is what is currently selected, AAA needs to show up down here. Simple enough. Finally, we've got force. I want to be able to come into the force selection box that we've added down here and type an index in and make the computer jump straight to, or the list box, jump straight to that particular index. So if I came down here and typed in, let's say, three, and then hit enter, I want to see this thing automatically, zero, one, two, three. I want to see it automatically select this guy right here so that we can show how to force selections. So this is kind of the goal. This is what we're going to go for. Sound good, Logan? Yeah, sounds like a plan. All right, let's see if we can put it together. Let's go and jump over into Turbo Delphi. All right, so here we go. We've got a blank empty Delphi. We're going to start with a VCL forms application. And of course, feel free to jump back and forth over that picture if you need it. Okay. 
I'll rough it out, and we'll compare it after I get done. And, yeah, and he's absolutely out. right here. This is just all being roughed out. There are no specific numbers or anything like that that we need to worry about. So first thing is going to be the list box. You'll notice it right here up under our standard controls. Yeah, I've gone ahead and selected it, and I'm going to draw out a list box out on the form. Make it like a little so. bit narrower than that. Something like so? Yeah, that's perfect. And we had those ads. So we had to buttons. actually do a T-edit up underneath. Oh, oh yeah, the T-edit comes first. So we've got a T-edit, and then we've got some buttons. Some buttons. So I'll add one button for add, and then I'll copy and paste that button. Move it to the other side, and then slide these a little bit closer together, something like that. Okay, go ahead and make them say add and remove. And a quick tip, guys, go, go ahead and do like the ampersand add and ampersand remove, just so they can see that they can do hotkey associations if they want. So you see how the A now has an underscore, and now the R has an underscore. So shortcut. Hot yeah, keys. if you're tapping through them with a keyboard, it could make it easier. It'll let you jump to it without requiring the tabbing. So that's list box, an edit, and an add and remove button. Okay. Now we need our information displays. Okay. Now in order to get something that has... Um, Right here we've got things like telling us what these boxes are, that this one is going to be the number of items versus this one that's going to be the selected text. Um, in order to indicate that in our app so we're not just guessing at blank labels, we're going to put these under group boxes because group box has a title, a visible title, up at the top. So if we drag one of these out, you see we have an A, or it's um, captioned group box one right now. We could change that to something more relevant like... Um, just say number of items. So Okay. We could probably have the word. Yeah, I'm sure we could. Okay, good. And we've got that maybe a little bit larger. And then we need something to display the item inside of it because we've already used a caption on setting the title up here. We need some information inside, and we can drop down a label for that. So drop a label in. Now, this is going to differ a little bit from a standard label in that we want this text to center up instead of uh, locked to the left. And before I change that, I want to change the uh, the auto size property. Normally, when you type in a label, it'll shrink down to the size of the text. In this case, we want to keep it keep a width so that we keep it centered, and that means auto size would get in the way. So, looking for uh, center now. Alignment. Yep. Center. So there's a type of alignment, and there we go. Much better. Now go ahead, just stretch it out, and then just control move it down or nudge it down. So there we go. Something like that looks good. Now and grab and paste the whole box. Yeah, with this set up now, I grab the entire thing. Not both of them like that. Just the uh, the top level, the uh, group box. And we can copy and paste that in, and all of the children of the list box, meaning this label, will come along with it. So there's our second info box and our third information display box. Okay, so let's go ahead and change the caption in the second one. And we'll have it say selected index. And then something maybe selected text. Yeah, or. which is perfect. All right, now let's start out by adjusting those labels. The first label, now you're probably going to give them some names because we're going to need to obviously set some code to address them. So this can be um, something like LBL number, maybe LBL total. I'll go with that. We'll see if it okay. works. Okay, and the next one, LBL selected maybe. Selected... I'll differentiate these. these okay. That one can be selected index, where this one can be selected, selected text. text. Sounds good. Right. All right, now let's go ahead and set captions. That first one, number of items, should start out at zero because there's zero items in the list box. Selected index. This should start out as negative one. Negative one means nothing is selected. So perfect. And then selected text, we'll just simply empty that out. All right, so let's go ahead and drop a label down now at the bottom and have that say force selection. Okay. Force selection. Okay, and then let's put a uh, edit field in there. Do you want it um, below it or to the side of it? I was just to the side of what I was drawing out on the uh, picture a second ago. It doesn't have to be a big box because you're not going to be typing big numbers in it. So something about like something that like that work. And we can just put nothing in there. So we'll take its text and blank that out. Or not name, text. There's that. Okay. And you want to go ahead and give it a name? or Actually, sure. name is going to be irrelevant here. 
Only because we're not going to ever put information in it. We'll just simply hit enter and right. capture that key information and do something with it. So but where right. it says edit one, this we can go ahead and give a name because that's going to be important. So we could call this EDT um, entry. Okay. And uh, we'll clear the caption or text out of that. All right. So now we have our very basic application set up, but we do not have any functionality in place and this is what we're going to need to do now the very first thing and that is get functionality running the very first thing is going to be getting the add button to work let's jump over here to photoshop so for the add button to work what we're going to do when we start talking to this is did you give that guy a name or is he just list box one the, the button or no, the, the uh, list box itself no the list box is still list box one okay it hasn't been named yet so we'll start out with list box one now what are we talking to on list box? So I've got a dot right here. Well, we're going to be talking to the items. Because, I mean, it's still a control. It has other things like a top and a left. And Absolutely. With. Now, with items, we have all sorts of things that are built in. For those of you, by the way, that understand list boxes a little bit more than what we're explaining, don't worry about it. We'll get everybody up to speed a little bit later. You know what I'm talking about, right, Logan? Um, Getting into yeah, the, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're just we're going to keep this very elementary. So list box one, we're going to talk to the items, and with the items in the case of add, what we want to do is we're going to simply say add, and add takes in a string. So all we need to do is give it an open parenthesis, a single quote, and put some sort of string information in here. Close that single quote, and then close our parentheses and end it with a terminator. And this right here will add whatever text we put in here into our list box up at the top okay now remember the way we want this to work though is we want to put whatever is in the box right here up there then with that being the case instead of putting just a string in there what we'll do is we will reference what you call it ed it was, uh, edt entry edt entry and then we'll talk to his text so whatever is in edt entries text is what is going to get added into our list box. So that's what's going on. I'm not going to do this for every single one. I just wanted to kind of give you guys an idea of, of the breakdown, how we're talking to the list box, to its items, and then we're going to start calling upon methods. So let's go ahead and jump back over real quick and code in the add button. Okay. So we need to talk to that list box. List box. You're not... Oh, there it goes. Okay, it's just real slow. Okay. <laughs> And we need to, inside of the list box, look at items. And there's items. And from items, we need to add an item. So we have add and whatever string we want to take in. It's not a hard-coded string. It's the I string demonstrate from it real item. quick. Just uh, open okay. quote and Just put like hello the, world. We're in no rush here. All right, so the, just like I demonstrated a second ago, let's go ahead and run that. And hit add. And hello world appears. And now if you go hit add a whole bunch of times, it <laughs> just adds hello world. And we can select them. And we can multi-select at the moment, can we not? Um, I don't or think multi-select all by default. by default. All it's going to do is just drag through all the items. Good. It's, all, it's off by default. Excellent. That's all I want to do is make sure that that wasn't going to be an issue. Because remember, we're going to deal with this from a single select point of view. Okay, so now that we have that in place, let's make it actually put the text that's in that edit entry box in there. So we'll replace our hard-coded text with edt entry dot text. And I'm not going to save that. I'll just run it. All right, so now type something in. Cat. And we'll add the cat. And I'll put dog. And we'll add the dog. All right, fantastic. So now we know how to add something. The next thing on our list was how do we remove something? So now this is where things start to get a little bit more interesting, wouldn't you say? For sure, is we have to re-reference these. Well, so far we've just blindly added. We don't care where in the list it appears. We just want to add it to the list. Remove When we get into remove, where in the list something is becomes important. Right. So for doing that, now what we have to do is we have to deal with... I said I wasn't going to do this for everyone, but I guess we can go ahead and jump back on our whiteboard and do it for just one more. So this line goes up for remove. So we're going to do list box again. And again, we're talking to the items. And then here's where things start to get different. Now, instead of adding, what we want to do is delete. 
But it's not quite as easy as what we had up above in this area right here. I mean, up above, we were able to just come in there and put text in, and that's what got added. But now we're not adding something. We need to specifically delete something. And what we want to delete is what is currently selected. And remember what I said earlier? Let's go ahead and highlight this or underline this so you guys will bring your attention back up here. To know if something is selected, remember it was the item index. Remember I said this would make more sense in a few minutes. Ah, this is where we're going to have to start using the whole index thing I was talking about a second ago. So starting with the very first one, that's zero, one, two, three, whichever one is selected, that's the item index. So the item index is what is going to need to come. Let's find out where my mouse is. That is what's going to need to come in here. But we can't just put item index in there, can we? It's, we need to talk to the whole thing. Right, because item index is part of the list box. It's not just a number floating out in space. Exactly. So going in here, what we'll have to do is actually say uh, list box. One, yes, that's one, dot items, or item, index. Remember, item index, right here. So listbox one dot item index, that is an X, I promise, it just looks funny. We put that into here, and then the whole thing will work properly. Right, and then remove becomes a remove selected. That's right. So let's go ahead and code that in real quick. All right, jumping over here, we can jump back to design and then jump into the remove buttons click event. And from here, we need to say list box one dot items dot. There's delete. And delete takes in an index, which is an It integer. takes in an integer. You don't even have, yeah, because you don't have to delete what's selected. You can delete anything out of there. Remember, you every single entry has an index starting at zero. So you so can delete whichever one. Just like we did with the add, we could try hard coding in a number and just looking at what the result would be. So if I added just any random gibberish entry and then hit remove, of course, I, I selected it first. If I added it before selecting it, remove still works. Mm -hmm. And if I add some more things... I can remove those as well. And it's always removing zero, just like on the whiteboard. The first one is index zero. I'm deleting index zero here. So every time I hit remove, it's the top one. It's uh, they're the first one that's getting deleted. Exactly. But in this case, since we want to do what is currently selected, now we can go ahead and just code that in. Right. And here's one other thing to keep in mind that we'll be um, addressing here in a minute when we get some of the other functionality. And that is there has to be some item to delete for delete to work. If I hit remove and I take out that last one, so now there's nothing there to select. If I hit remove again, that should have... Well, in certain cases. Yes, yeah, you're going to get a, uh, a nice a little... Addressing error problem. Right. Um, so now let's change this and plug in item index so that we can have this be selection dependent. So we can say list box one dot item index. Now it's going to be whatever's currently selected. So we can add some entries like so. And add one more so you can delete the third one out. Or right. the middle one. All right, so there's the middle one is the dog entry. So if we remove, now dog goes away. Perfect. And we can remove either one of those three and then remove cat. And hit remove again. All right, good enough. So close that. Now here's what I want you to do. Now you could make this uh, fail safe easily by making sure something is selected. We addressed that, didn't we, just a second ago in our whiteboard. If I jump over here real quick, didn't I show you guys that selected index? So we're, we're back to dealing with this guy right here. Didn't I have you put a negative one in there to start out with? Because remember when I said negative one means nothing is selected. So we could just simply say uh, list box one dot item index. If it is um, anything greater than minus one, then you can delete it. Because if it's minus one, we don't want to delete anything because nothing's selected. Right. Because so, if it's if it has a zero, that means item zero is selected. That's right, the very first one. So let's go ahead and code that in real quick. So we'll throw a very simple if around this. So we could say if, and I'm going to copy this to save a little I bit of typing. I don't blame you. So you're saying if it was greater than negative one, so something is selected, then, then and we'll have this happen. Yeah, perfect. And we can test it out real quick. And I'm sure it was working because it wasn't it wasn't erring before. Yeah. So but now, I mean, but go ahead and run it real quick and add at least one thing in and make sure it deletes that one thing out, just to show everyone it is indeed. Think. 
remove perfect. Okay. Of course, you could show this. We have something added, but with nothing selected, nothing gets removed. Right. Very nice. All right, so now that we have that in place, let's see. So it's adding, it's removing. Let's go ahead and start showing the count and the selected index and all that good stuff over in the corner. All right, bring all the uh, information displays online. Exactly. So this is where, what I want to do for this is, if you guys recall, in episode number four, we talked about variables. In episode number five, we got into functions and procedures. And I told you guys in that episode that we were going to start using functions and procedures more and more. And this is where we're going to start doing it right now. So, Logan, let's go ahead and create just a simple procedure, something that's called, like, update stats or something. And we can start putting all of the functionality for updating those information boxes for us in this one procedure. And then the, the convenient thing for doing that is when we hit the Add button, after it adds the entry, let me look for my mouse. I can demonstrate this a little bit better by just grabbing and highlighting like such. After we do this section right here, we can then simply call Update Stats. After we remove, we can call update stats. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Right, because just looking at the form, it looks like there's three different things that we have to do right. in order to have all of stats updated. Exactly. And to do those three things over and over again is redundant. It's duplicate code. Exactly. And we told you guys that was one of the benefits of procedures that kept us from doing that. So let's go ahead and define ourselves a procedure called update stats. Okay. I'm going to put that under the private section for this form. Okay. So we'll say that this is a procedure. Procedure, and it is update stats. And I'll hit Control Shift C and let it fill in the rest for the procedure. Though I am going to take the whole thing just out of personal preference and move it above all the form events. So he just did a Control X and a Control V, cut and paste. As a matter of fact, just because I'm going to do this later in the MP3 player, I'm actually going to block down some comments. Go ahead. Just because this is how I'm going to divide things up in a minute. We'll say that these are our custom procedures. And that everything down here our form are procedures. These are form events. events. Yeah. Okay. So now update stats. The very first thing we want to do is we want to update the number of items that are in the list box. We want to show that at all times. So what did you call that guy again? <laughs> it was the first one would have probably been like LBL total or something. LBL total. All right, yeah, so let's is. just get that one working first. So LBL total dot caption equals what? Well, we want it to equal the total number of items within the list. Okay. So that means we're going to need to look at items, and items is, of course, in the list box. So we'll look at list box one and look at its items. Now watch how easy this is. He's going to now, call it within count. Within items, they, we, yeah, like you said, we have a, pro, or a property called count. Items dot... So oh, and, I, and it's not pulling it up right now because it's looking for strings to put into caption. You're right. Go ahead, and put that, go ahead and put it in now. All right. And, uh, and you can terminate it. Now there is a problem with this, and if Logan goes to compile it real quick, there yeah. are errors, and here's the error, and there it is. Incompatible types, string and integer, because... LBL total dot caption is going to take a string in because it's alphanumeric text. I mean, it's just alphanumeric stuff, if you will. It has no meaning. But listbox one dot items dot count is going to give us an integer. It gives us an actual number. So we need to convert that number over to just text. And to do that, we can simply say do int to string and then put that in parentheses so that we're sending listbox one dot items dot count to into string to convert it and then that gets put over into captions and now or caption excuse me let's go ahead and run it and nothing's going to happen go ahead and add something into the box because even though the procedure is defined we're not calling on it so number of items is going to remain at zero so all we need to do now is close that come down to our add so here's our add section and let's go ahead and call update stats and here's where the benefit of procedures come into play. Let's jump down to our remove real quick. And we can go ahead and block in uh, that if statement so that we're doing everything inside. So it's Okay, so don't um, do anything else outside of it. I got you. So now we're going to do a begin and end. That is because we're wanting to do multiple things if this if statement evaluates to true. So now we've got update stats in two areas. Watch this. Let's go ahead and run it. Watch how convenient this is. Now we can add a couple things in. 
Look at the number of items. It's growing. Now let's uh, remove one of those. And it just dropped down. Very convenient. So, again, a chunk of code in one place, all nicely packaged up with a procedure name. And then we can call upon that procedure with the add button and remove button. And then it just does its thing. Right. It, it's already becoming very convenient. And we're only doing one out of the three things we have to update. Exactly. Okay, so the next thing we can go ahead and do, and that is, which one do you want to throw in next? You want to do the uh, item index? Looking at this, yeah, we'll finish off the update stats. Yeah. So we can say that was LBL selected index, I think. Yeah, selected index it was, thinking back. And you guys should already know how to do this. It's going to be... Yeah, he's going to go ahead and put the int to string because we're getting a number back, but we need to convert it over to a string so that it can fit into caption. And you guys already know what it is. I mean, come on. What is it? It should be listbox index because that's what's currently selected. Simple. So nothing selected. Nothing selected because there's nothing to select until we add something. Then we select. No. And yeah, now check this out. The only place that we're calling on update stats at the moment from is the add button and the remove button. That's it. So for us to be able to select up there and have something else happen, that functionality is going to have to be called on from someplace else, perhaps? So um, we can demonstrate that. If I add cat again, then all of a sudden it updates. Now it updates now. properly. Yep. So let's see. Um, do you want to get that tied in so that we can go sure, through the list can, yeah. to look at it? Sounds good. If we go over to the list box itself and look at its events, one of the input events we have is on click. Mm -hmm. So we can use that to fire off and update stats. See, guys, how helpful procedures are? Look how, look how redundant the code would have to be if we didn't have procedures. So he clicks. Look at that. Selected index is now showing zero, and it's also proving what I said a few minutes ago when I drew the picture for you back over in Photoshop. As a matter of fact, I'll just jump back over to the whiteboard real quick. Remember what I said about the, uh, so hard to find, where am I at? There I am. Right here, zero. The very first thing selected, index for it, is zero. And we now see that if we jump back over into Turbo Delphi, it is zero. Okay? So, let's go ahead, and now that we've got that tied in, what do we want to do next? We could go on to the, the last piece of text and looking at getting text out. Let's do it. So, our last label is LBL selected... Text. text and now we need to get what we need to get so far we've just gotten the number and that selected number is the only thing that we can access directly we can't say something like list box ones dot item text or selected text right but we can get individual items out mm -hmm. and um, ir irrelevant to their selection actually and we could do that with Listbox one dot talk to the items, and talk the property strings. one is strings. That pulls out a string. Now we have to feed it an element. Uh, we have to feed it a, a, a excuse me an uh, an index. Right. So what index are we looking at? You know, if we said zero, it's always going to grab whatever mm -hmm. index zero is. Demonstrate it. And it's not quite happy yet because I haven't closed the program. A <laughs> good reason. So we'll just. Adds an and you can see cats down there in selected text, but it's not actually selected. And no matter how many things Logan goes in and adds, it's always going to just say text because, or excuse me, cat, because cat is index zero. So there we can see it matching up. There's zero. There's a selected index of zero being cat. The problem is we're not plugging in this selected index. So I'm changing selected index that's not influencing the text yet. So and that's easy to change. We could just take item index or list box one dot item index, plug that into this uh, the index that strings is looking for, and then everything is all linked together. So now I could add something. So when he adds cat, ooh, there we go. Very nice. So what's that? Okay, there's there's one place where we can do a check. Mm -hmm. well, if we I, let to. me run that again and take a closer look at the error. 
I add this in and we get an error that is list index out of bounds and saying that negative one was the number that was out of because bounds. Because you're trying to grab a string that's at negative one, but negative one means nothing selected out of bounds. That's right. It's, our bounds start at zero. Right. There's there's nothing before zero in the list box. Negative ones means nothing. It doesn't mean that there's like a blank item you can get that's to. That's right. So we have to check that. We've got to make sure once again that we're above negative one. So we can come down here and steal this code and paste it right there. And I'm not sure if we're going to finish this off with more things, but I'm going to let it do a begin and end. Okay. Just because if we added something else, we wouldn't have to worry about it. So again, just a real quick recap. All he's doing, we're still working on our update stats procedure. So there's our LBL total, our LBL selected index. But when we're dealing with the item index, or I'm sorry, with the uh, actual uh, selected text that we're trying to populate with information, if we have an item index that is negative one, meaning if nothing is selected, we cannot come in here and use this. We'll get an error every time. We can't say listbox1.items.strings and then tell it the index negative one. There's no such thing. That means nothing is selected. That's an error. So now we're simply saying if the item index is something greater than minus one, that means it's zero, which means it's pointing to the first one. It's one. That means the second thing's selected, so on and so forth. That means something is selected then we can go ahead and populate the caption with that particular string. Otherwise, we're simply going to skip over this. So long story short, we should have fixed our error box. And let's add some text. Notice now good. selected text, yeah, it stays empty. Now if I click on it, Aha. okay, so item index is now a valid index. That's right. And we can get cat from that index because so that was the first item. hit remove. Now, check that out. So minus one, but why does that still say cat? We haven't cleared it. It's going to hold right. its value until we tell it to be something else. So we could always break out an else. Yep. And um, I don't know. I don't have a preference as to whether you want to do an else begin or just an any, else. Any, any way you want to do it. So this would work for multiple lines, but there's nothing wrong with having a single line. That'll work, too. And we could take that and clear it, link it just, back out because yep. now we don't have anything to show. Two individual single quotes means put nothing in there. Just clear it. So we can add something. It gets selected. It gets shown as the selected. After being removed, nice. there's nothing to show because there's no item and nothing is selected. Beautiful. So now all of that is working quite well. So really only one thing left, and that's the uh, force of selection down there because that's going to become important when we get over into the MP3 player because there should never really be a time that we have songs in our playlist but none, nothing selected. There should always be something selected. That means we're going to need to force selections from time to time. So what I want to be able to do is actually type a number into that box, hit enter on the keyboard, and make that particular item selected based off the number I put in. Okay. So from here, since we don't have a, uh, a button, like you said, we want the enter key press to activate it. Mm -hmm. We can look over in its events under input, and we have an on mouse. Let's see. Oh, no, not a mouse. A key. <laughs> on key. So you want um, up or down. Uh, yeah. Whichever one you want to use. I'll do on key down. Okay. So now this is going to work for any key. We need to check for a specific key. Right. We're going to look for the enter key. So we can start the whole thing off with an if and say if. If key, key, you'll notice in the procedure we receive some information. We get the key. We get information being populated in the key variable. Uh, what key it is that the user just pressed. Now, key is going to be a numeric code for a key. It's not going to be an ASCII key that we could check by using a string. Right. We have to check it by using a number. But to simplify things and keep uh, standards in force and simplified, there's a predefined variable or no, predefined value mm -hmm. that holds the, the values for different keys. One of those is VK return. And if we hover over that, we can see that it has a numeric value, and it's defined somewhere else. I could control-click on it and just very briefly jump into this Windows unit, which is where it was defined, saying that VK return is actually equal to 13, which means we could have used 13. Yeah, we could have just said if key equals 13. But now remember, he just showed you the Windows unit. Remember, if you scroll up to the top in our uses section, we're using Windows. That's how it knows about it. That, that's where it came from. So we can say that if the key is the return or enter key, then let's see. Did you want to do a, a begin under this one? or? Yeah, you're going to do a begin. It just simply has it set up then. 
So if it was the enter key, then we want to take whatever was entered into this box and select that inside the list box. Right. So we're going to be looking at list box one dot items, or rather item index for the uh, the selected one. We need to set that to something. Mm -hmm. We need to set it to whatever number was in the edit. But the edit is text. We need to convert the text to an integer. String to an integer. So we have to go from str to int, and then we can take in. Um, did we name that? I think we did. I just don't remember what it was. Yeah, he's just edit two. It looks like, or did he name it? Yeah, it's edit no, two. No, it's edit two. Yeah. So edit two dot text, and that. And we we can go ahead and call uh, update stats too because it's obviously changing the selected text. But I can already see where some logical problems can come into place. So let's see, force selection. Zero. That would have to be zero, and, and it worked. Nice. So go ahead and add a couple more things in. Dog, some numbers. Now tell it to uh, select one, and that'll be the second thing selected will be dog. And that works great. And now select five. Okay. Hmm. Even though it's being nice and not giving us an error or something, we can put a little bit of logic in here to prevent us from going above and beyond by making sure that we have at least as many items in there as you're wanting to select, if that makes sense. Right, meaning, yeah, don't allow the list index to go out of the, uh, the bound set. Right. So before setting this, we could do a check and Just, say... Yeah, check the items count. And, um, oh, you want to check the items count again? I was just that? saying if the items count is greater than the number that you put in there, that means then we can obviously select that number. Yeah, guys, we're kind of coding this live and on the fly right now, so we have two different ideas of logic directions, and, and both of them are just perfectly fine. So that way we could say that if the number of items is greater than the one we're looking for, mm -hmm. then go ahead and allow it. Yeah. Because that means that number will, I mean, if we have 10 items, then I know I want to select number 9. Well, number 9 is going to be good because I've got 10 items in there. So, yeah, it's good. 2 does nothing, which is what it's supposed to do. And 0 gets us back to the beginning. Beautiful. So, that's working. All right, so that's all good. So, is there anything else? Or did we just hit it all? I think that's everything that we needed to do here. We've got add functionality. We've got remove functionality. And we have all of our displays set up. Okay. Well, man. That's not bad. All right, so I guess the next thing we're about to do is turn our attention over to the MP3 player. So um, go ahead, run this one last time, Logan, and add about five different things in there. So I'll have a cat and a dog. So I'm watching the number of three. items continue to grow. Selected index should stay negative one because you haven't selected anything. And selected text is blank. Okay, cool. Now as you start selecting stuff, Everything comes to life over there. Selected index is shown what index starting at zero, so it's always zero based. And then we get the text. We can force our selections. Nice. Nice. And we can remove as well, so you can remove anywhere from inside there. All right. Very nice. Now, with that, I guess uh, you could. I do know one more thing we could throw in here. You notice when you hit remove how it doesn't, it's nothing is selected anymore? You could have it auto-select something. Yeah, we could. And it sounds a little bit simpler than it actually is. But <laughs> if we wanted to do that, the uh, the simple method seems to just restore the uh, the selection. So let's go down here to our delete system. Now, to restore the selection means we're going to need to remember what was selected. Right. So we're going to need to define a variable for ourselves. We could call that old index. And that could be an integer. Okay. And before we do the delete now, we could say we will set the old index to equal whatever item we're about to delete. Like so. And after that, we can then use it in things like deletes. Very so nice. So remember which one we're going to delete. Delete it. And now we can do some selecting. So we could say list box one dot item index is equal to our old index and restore the selection. Mm -hmm. And in certain cases, that'll work. So we can add a few things. We can add, like so. If we select one of them, 
Hit remove. We maintain a selection. Ah, we, yeah, we are maintaining a selection. Very nice. But now if we have the last thing, I can go ahead and add a three. If we have the very last thing selected, we lose our selection. The last thing again, lose the selection. It's only when the first thing or something other than the last item is selected. Right. The problem is, if we take out the last item, that's no longer a valid item index. So we need to do a check. Before we set this, we need to look at old index and see if it's still within bounds, kind of the way we do it here, where we check to see if this, if it's within range of the count. Okay. So before we do this, we could look at old index and say that if old index is greater than this box so we'll one check dot out count here items dot count I think I have to do minus one here because because the index yeah. is zero base right because if we have three items in the list so the count is three that means the highest selectable item Would is going two. to be two right so if that's the case then that means we're trying to select something off the edge and we can just instead set old index to be the items minus one. So that means, let's say old index held three. Let's go ahead and change that greater than sign to... Oh, yeah, to an equals. Let's save a compiling error. But that way, if we have an old index of three, meaning there were four items, then the number of items becomes three items here, which means that two is the highest selectable. I know it gets confusing to follow the... Uh, the train. Write it out on paper, guys, if this is confusing. Remember, count is truly how many items are in there. If, Like Logan said a second ago, if you've got three items in there, what's the count? Three. What's the indexes? Zero, one, two. So the highest number in regards to an index would be two, not three. So that we're playing on a level playing field, that's why we take our count and we subtract one. So now our numbers are going to coincide on both sides. So that means that if we've gone over the edge, we simply select the uh, last item in the list. So, try this out. Cat, dog, and now if I select the last item, remove, we still ah, have some items nice. selected. So I can do some more things, like so. The middle item, or even the last item after this. All that works, all that works, and all the way back down. Fantastic. All right, now I can honestly say... I'm happy. I knew that there, for a second there was something else I wanted to show them. I like that because we're going to want that to happen as well over in the MP3 player because yeah. when you select a song and you delete it out, you don't want the selection to be cleared. You always want a song selected in the MP3 player. It only makes sense. So with that, Logan, you ready to say goodbye to our simple application here and jump back into our MP3 player? Yeah, sounds good. All right, let's go ahead and close this one out. All right, we'll do a close all on project one. That it's clears gone. everything out. Now we need to get back to the MP3 player we've been working on this far. I'll go to open, and we're still within our Bolin Studio projects, and here we have our MP3 folder, which is where we've been keeping everything so far. Inside of that, we have mp3player.bdsproj. We can open that, and I'm going to close out this main program unit that opens, and then we're staring back at the simple MP3 player. All right. So what are our objectives now? Because our first set of objectives have been met. We saw how the list box works. We've done add, remove. We've looked at item index. We've looked at item.strings. We've played with all that good stuff. Now our ob objectives are going to shift. What we need to do is we're going to create some custom procedures with our MP3 player. We're going to do an add file procedure. We're going to do a play item procedure. And we're going to do a remove item procedure. Why are we going to do this? Because in each of these cases, add file, play item, and remove item, there's multiple places this code can exist. And remember, one of the key pieces of, um, one of the key benefits of having procedures is you don't have to have redundant code. For instance, for adding a file, we can add a file from down here. We can also come up here and add a file by simply opening a file and start playing and have that added into the system. So there's a couple of places right there we can add a file from. Play file, well, I can select the file down here and hit play up here. Or how about coming down here and double clicking? We're all used to doing that with most any and every MP3 player out there. Again, the code would have to exist in two different places if we did not put this code into a procedure. And then uh, remove items. How about being able to come down here and select a particular song and then hit the remove button? Or how about select the song and hit the delete key on your keyboard? Anytime you're dealing with multiple places where the code will need to go, put it in a procedure or a function. It just 
makes sense. Don't you agree, Logan? Yeah, most definitely, because you have identical functionality in many cases, and then we can combine that functionality by packaging it into procedures. Precisely. Makes it a lot cleaner. So we're going to be adding those procedures in as we work our way through continuing the uh, simple MP3's functionality. Then what we need to do is we need to make our uh, add and remove buttons work with those new procedures. We're going to need to change the play button around now because right now the play button just basically plays whatever stream's been open, but now we've got to start dealing with what's selected in our playlist to play which means this guy is going to be changed around. Um, we need to worry about having something always selected down here. Uh, let's see, anything else? I think for the most part, that's going to be it, the functionality of the playlist in regards to adding, removing, and playing from the list. That's what we need to do. So first thing we want to do, let's go ahead and create, I don't know, let's start with the add file procedure so we can start getting things into that. Wait, okay, hang on. Uh -huh. But this does allow me to talk about one more thing. I know some of you guys are like, come on, get on with it, but trust me on this. We're going to do something basic here, very basic. We're actually going to start out, Logan, if you don't mind, before we write that procedure, how about let's make a second list box. Before we do it, let's show them why. I want to keep two sets of information. Wow, that's a lot of stuff there. Let's go ahead and delete all of that. I want to keep a running list of song names and that's you guys are looking at that right now it's that list box over there I then want to keep an in sync associated list of song paths Does that makes sense Logan meaning that Let's say that the very first song up here is YYZ by Rush. And so that's how we're seeing in the playlist. That's our first song in the playlist. I also, somewhere else, need to keep track of where that's at. Let's say it's at C colon backslash music backslash and that's where YYZ.mp3 exists. So index zero and index zero here need to always be tied in sync. That's why in that particular case, the viewer then using this application will see the playlist. But then when we go to, to actually manipulate the song and all, we know where to load it from because we can then find its path. Right. The, uh, the idea is to keep the playlist cleaner looking because a simple way to get around this would be to have the playlist show the full file name. Because that way, anytime we need to load a file, we have the name right there. Right. The problem is it's very dirty looking for the playlist. Yeah, exactly. You, ju you just want to see songs, not the paths. Exactly. So what we can do um, to avoid getting into more complicated or advanced topics is, of course, there's different ways of doing this. This is... Um, the idea would be that that second list box is hidden out later, so you don't right. see it at all. And there's other ways of storing information, but right now, to keep things simple and keep it within the bounds of what we know so far. Right, yeah. For those of you that might have some, uh, some level of programming skills from other languages, or even with Delphi, obviously we can start getting into arrays, or there's other object types out there that we can use to help manage this data. But again, like Logan said, we want to keep this in the realm of what we already know, what we've taught so far. So for doing this in the most simplistic way, we can simply add a second box right here. And then we'll just keep the two boxes in sync. So anytime we're dealing with a particular song, we know what index we're talking to here. We'll make sure we're talking to the same index down here when we deal with the path. And like Logan said, by doing this method, this guy down here can be kept hidden. This guy up here can be kept simple. It just has song names in it. Yeah, that, that'll, that'll help a lot with the look of everything. So let's do that first. All right. Jumping back over to Delphi, we have our uh, one list box. We need to add that second one that's going to have the hidden but full paths. So I can jump down to list box, and we'll drag one out right over the existing one, something like that. Okay. And I am going to do a little bit of things to the layout. Even though we're going to hide it in the end, this will help for uh, debugging sometimes. We can take the right and set that to be anchored, just in case we have a really long path and the MP3 player is messing up and we want to debug and find what the problem is. Right. You can always look at it that way. All right, let's go ahead and get some names in there, too. All right. Now, the original playlist list box has not been named yet. It wasn't named in the earlier video, so now would be a very good time to get <laughs> to that name named. <laughs> yeah. I'll call this one LB Playlist because it's the actual visible playlist. 
This one is going to be the full path with file name. I, um, I want to keep the, uh, the entire thing there instead of just the path. Because if we had the path, we'd have to combine this list box with this one to get the final name. Right. Since we're using a second list box anyway, we could have the entire thing. Just LB files. So this, each of these items will link to a file. Each of these items are just for a name. Okay. So with that, if right, you're so ready. Now we got those. So yeah, now I'm ready. Let's go ahead and add the add file procedure and start making it work. Okay. Instead of jumping immediately into a buttons event, we're going to keep this module or modularized. So we have a, gen, uh, a generic add files procedure. So procedure add files. Or, excuse me, just yeah, file, add, add file. one at yeah. a time. Now, this its job is going to be to take in a file name as a string and add that into the list boxes. Okay. So we're going to be looking for a file name, which is a string, like so. And I'll use Control-Shift-C to fill that in. So Control-Shift-C, guys, don't forget, Logan has shown you this before. Just aut just set up your template for that procedure. Yeah, for me, it just boils down to less typing because I don't have to put begin But now remember, when everything. he does this, he's now probably going to cut that and move it up to the top so we can do custom procedures. It's uh, already at the top. Yeah, what it, do you know? How convenient. I'll, I will probably have to do that later, though. Yeah, you want to go ahead and lay out the uh, comments? Yeah, that would be a good idea. It makes it a lot easier if you're ever jumping through code, just scrolling through, looking for something. It's really nice to have it laid out so you can see things in major sections. So custom procedures, and then just being picky about casing. So the custom procedures, and then our form events. Like so. Okay, beautiful. So add file. What does add file need to do? Well, it's going to have to work with that open dialog that we had because we're opening a file much like the original open button. Mm -hmm. We still need the same type thing to happen. We need to have an open dialog appear. And it just so happens we've done that underneath that button, so I can start out by stealing this code and dropping it in here. We want to activate and execute the open, dial or open dialog song. Okay, dialog hang on. Box. Now, he's taking in a string right now. We're sending it the name in already. From file? From file. Um, um, when we when we uh, basically go to add a file, we're going to go ahead and just send it that file name already. So, do you sure you want to go with that approach? Mm, we could leave the open dialog on a button if we wanted to do it that way. Okay, either either way. Let's see. So, if we had a file name coming in, then what all I was we'd have left we could is to just add it to the list. Just boxes. add it. To, yeah, exactly. Let's just keep this real simple. And items. And we'll just add the file name. And what's real nice is we can just say lb playlist.items.add, and then we can just say extract file name, and that takes care of both for us. This way, we're just keeping the procedure tied to its job is simply to add this, this stuff, this information here, to those two boxes. Make sense? Yeah. What I'm thinking? Okay. So with that in place, mm -hmm. now we just need to simply, when we hit the open button, and, and as a matter of fact, pull back over to the design real quick. What we can do first is focus on the plus button right there and have that do the open. So we can grab that open code that you had up here in the open there. You guys can't see me. I'm pointing all over the place for Logan <laughs> to the monitor. But you can grab that open code, paste it down there, and then just use the um, file name that it sends back to call the procedure and pass it the file name. So that's somewhere where we could take this. Yes. And, and put it there. Drop it in here. I right, go ahead and show them again where you went, just so that it, that was real quick. They, okay. Just so they saw. Um, all I did was I started by uh, copying the code that I wanted from here. And that code from there, in case you guys are, are lost, it's BTN open click. And if you go to design real quick, um, it's the show them the oh, double. Yeah, it's that guy. Double click on that, it'll jump you right in there. So he just copied that same code, pasted it up there into the add click button. So now we have that beautiful. And from that, that after executing should hold the file name within Open DLG song. So we could feed that over to add file. Let's say Open DLG song dot file name. Yep, beautiful. And so, look at, look at that, look at that, That's, hang on, I, I just got to grab this, it's so nice here. So now what Logan says, you click that plus button and it's going to open up the dialog, and if they hit cancel, and of course, then we just simply exit out altogether, but if not, 
Then we come back and we call that new procedure that Logan just put and we send whatever the file name we get back from Open Dialog to the procedure. Here's the procedure. That name that we just sent, which is a full path with the name at the end, gets populated in the file name variable. And then we come down here and we simply add that whole path and file name to the LB files list box. And then we turn around and we add it also to the playlist list box. But check it out. We extract so that just the file name is what is going into the playlist list box. All right. Well, with that under the button, we now have it all linked up. We can test it. So I'll save, compile, and run. And now if we hit or if we hit add, mm -hmm. that triggers the open dialog box. If we click on a song and hit open, then it gets fed in. So it looks like it's working. Oh, As a matter nice. of fact, we see our other one that we haven't hidden yet. If I s slide the window out now a little bit. You can see the benefits of Logan doing the anchoring there so that it stretches. So we see we have a much more friendly display of a song, and then we have the full link to the entire file. Yeah, like Logan said a few minutes ago, we could have just used one list box and put that entire path in the list box, but come on, look how much junk is there. We don't want to see all of that. Okay, cool. So now that we've got that in place, next thing, we make the... Want to start making the play work with what's in there? Yeah, we can set up uh, for playing. Now, that's another interesting consideration, is up until now, play has only happened within, within a button. If I go directly to this button's play click event, we're, that's it. That's all we have for play right now, is just telling bass to play something. Yes, play, say and play the stream, and that's already been set up when we did the very simple open up at the top. And we can't just reuse this and put this in a procedure because it's saying play whatever the currently open stream is. And now that we have a playlist, it's possible that we have a different item selected, and we would want play to play the uh, the current item. Right. What it boils down to is we want play to be aware of the playlist. Right. It, well, it has to start using it. So to do that, we could make a simple uh, procedure, and its job is to play whatever or whatever we tell it to, it, based yeah. on a uh, an index. Yeah, and like I said at the very beginning, the objective would be to make a procedure called play file or play item. Or play item. Yeah, yeah play item. Why don't I say file? I'm still thinking add file. I'm staring right at it. That's what's going on. Play and the, item. And the thinking thus far is we've been working with things like index or indexes and mm -hmm. item index out of a list box. That way that could be fed to play item and we wouldn't have to resolve it every time. So that way we can just take in an item. What Logan's saying is integer. we don't want play item to have to worry about figuring out what things are selected in our list boxes. We want that information to already be determined. We just simply say, here's the index for the item we want you to play. It's almost like you walk up to a jukebox and you say, tink, tink, you type in 12. You, you're putting in the number for the song that you wanted to play. Precisely. So there's play item. Control-Shift-C will lock that in. And like you were saying earlier, I do want to copy this out and, and put it under the yeah. custom procedures. Okay, cool. Now, play item needs to look at whatever it was given and use that to determine what to play. So here's another consideration, is that if we already have a song, it, what it boils down to is this is going to replace the open functionality that we used to have. Right. If we look down a little bit, this is that open button we had. And right after running the open dialog, it does things like check for a stream and possibly free it, and then load a brand new stream. Mm -hmm. Now, what would happen in play item if you're playing the first song? You click on the second song and you click play. Well, it's going to have to unload the first song to get it out of the way, load the new song, and then continue. True. So we're going to need open functionality. As a matter of fact, I'm going to use this open functionality. So I'm going to cut this code out of the procedure, since once we come back around to open, it's going to have a different goal, a different mission in life when we get back to it. Open is going to happen on playing item. Whenever right. we play a new item, we'll open that before playing. So we've got this set up here. Now the problem is this code is only opening. It's not doing anything with it after it loads. Right. It. It's getting and the stream set up. It's getting our track bar set up. It's getting the display set up. Ooh, which while we're in there, that's two things we can fix real quick because I'm staring at it. Um, we've got stream equals. Well, yeah, it's not going to be a direct run because yeah. this is still looking at that open dialog. We need to take um, whatever was referenced through the list box through the item, exactly. meaning we have to address the playlist and files list box. So if I scroll over just a little bit, what we have now is we're telling it to open the open dialog's file name, which means whatever the last thing was opened. 
in right. the, the playlist. In this case, very simple. All we need to do is just say, do you want to do that or do you want to do LBL files? Because that contains our entire path. Oh, yeah, the, the full one. And then we can say, so here's our, yeah, the full one with our path. And then we can say items dot strings. And then we can oh, just yeah. tell it open square bracket item. Because remember, so. we're receiving, when we call play item, we send the item to it. We tell it what number, like I said a second ago with the jukebox example. So now we're going to come down here and we're going to basically create the string to this using the LBL files dot items dot strings and that particular item we point it to. And remember, LBL files, that list box contains the full path and the song uh, file name itself. So that okay, so with that in place, now we can go ahead, yeah, with the panel display, the caption, what we need to do is uh, we've got extract file name. We can get rid of that altogether, and we can simply just say use the playlist. Oops, wrong button. Uh, whoops. So. so, yeah, that one's just LB playlist dot items dot strings dot item. And since, you know, item's the same, I mean, the number hasn't changed. That's why... That's keeping our two list boxes in sync. So when I say um, play number 13, we're going to reference number 13 in LB files list box, and then we're going to reference number 13 in the LB playlist list box, and they're going to be the same information. Right, because associated. when we're adding them, we add them at the same time. Right. There's never a case. So if you were to accidentally leave one of these out somehow, of course you can't here. They both happen at the same time. Exactly. Then you'd have cases where they get out of out of order. Right. But because they're always added at the same time, that means their index is always going to be the same. So that means index 13 from our yeah our index 13 from the full file is the same thing as the index from the playlist. It's just this one has the full path. This one has the file name only. And obviously, in a minute when we get to removing. We need to make sure we remove from both at the same exact time using the same index so that everything stays in sync. All right, so now we have play. I guess we just ready. Uh, uh, everything else good? Check through. Just about. There is. This, this is just the open. opening. Yeah, we need to uh, play do it. the same thing as play, which is base channel play taking in stream. And you probably want to give it one more piece of information with that play. Yeah. And don't restart. Or do we start? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> One of those two. Okay. So that should work for play. So if we add something in, we'll add this song. Now, it should be playing yet. All we've done is the add. We haven't triggered a play. Right. But as we select it, you know, I don't think anything references play item just No, yet. it doesn't. We just got the procedure in place. We now need to have play actually work. Work. <laughs> So there's play. If we jump into that, that's playing whatever is active. Nothing's active yet, so nothing would have happened. Instead, we could... Um, I'm going to comment this now instead of simply deleting it because mm -hmm. there's some other things we need to address inside of play. Okay. For now, though, we're just going to use our play item procedure that we've created. And we're going to feed it whatever is selected in the, the list box. So LB index. Now, hang on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So we can add a song. And there's the song, not playing yet. If I select it and press play, then it gets loaded in. It and plays no more. So, that seems to be working there. Now, let's see, what do you want to touch on next? Well, let's see. Um, let's see. I've got over here, we're going to make the play work. Add the play procedure. Move code from open. We've done all of that. Modify code pull items out we've got all of that so change the play code we need to be able to call play item now we just did that so now we need to fix play okay so here's the here's the problem, problem we have with play is that remember before we had the the pause set up mm -hmm. so that pause would silence it and then play would continue and pause because pause itself doesn't unpause there's no way to unpause now because if you hit play it restarts it which the uh, reason it's doing that, if we look here, play is always playing a new item. Playing a new item means to first close the old one. Right. So there's that's it's completely restarting the song. Now, we do want pause to keep working, so we're going to have to do a check. If it's already playing, or if there's already a, uh, a stream there paused, just play it. Right. If there's no pause stream, then do the proper loading. Exactly. 
So we can start an if statement and check and say if base. Well, as a matter of fact, that's a good question. What do we check? Because this is this is something new now. Play we've we've dealt with before. Um, I'm going to jump over to the base help file for a second. Okay. Look under channels and look for what might be available. Because of course we've got our all our uh, play stuff and whatnot. Now to check the status, we can do we can look at channel is active. What channel is active will do is to check if it's playing or stalled. And look at that. If you look at the return value, it's got a few nice things down there. Is it stopped? Is it playing? Is it paused? Stalled? So that's that's what we can look for. That's what we want to know. Is if this is paused, that means we don't want to reload a new one because that'll cause a restart. So we can check for that by saying if base channel is active, if the result or if the return value of that is equal to base active was it yeah it was base active pause wasn't it or paused yeah, paused okay. with ed so if we're paused we don't want to reload instead we want to continue playing and that's why i commented that before as we can say um, just play that otherwise we can do an else and load a new one so if there's one paused just resume it if there's nothing paused load a new song based on whatever is selected all right let's go ahead and check and make sure it works and not yet. <laughs> well, it's not enough. Okay, yeah, you have to, when doing base active channel, you have to do what stream we're checking. And because you can have multiple streams at the same time. So, adding in a song, selecting the song, playing it, pausing it, resuming it. Pull now, it somewhere in the middle where it doesn't make it nervous. Really Good. So, paused. Still resuming from the middle. Okay. Now, if I hit play again, of course, the the, um, the his active return is not going to be paused. It's going to be playing, so that is going to restart it. Which is fine. But yeah, that's I think pretty much the same as Winamp. Yeah. So so far so good. All right. So now that we've got that in place, looking for the next thing. Next thing is going to be modify the play item procedure to verify that something is selected. Because so right now, when we hit the play button. We're not taking into account, is something actually selected? So we could get into a case where um, if we could feed it a bad item, kind of like the force selection box on the previous app. We, right. could, we could arbitrarily force it to play item 100 if there was nothing there. Right, which so could cause all sorts of problems for us. Let's do a simple check to say that if item is greater than zero... Or just if item is less than zero exit. Okay, yeah. That, that keeps the block really easier. Yeah. Yeah, that's perfect. So you guys see what's going on right there? That means if we call upon play item and we say we want to play number 66, but there's not 66 things in our Oh, actually, that, thing. that doesn't. That's just a, uh, a minus one check. Oh, wait, what am I thinking what here? I'd, Go ahead. Yeah, what I'd put that in for is if uh, nothing was selected. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's a nothing selected prevention. Error. Exactly, exactly. I'm getting ahead of myself real quick. That gets into the removal stuff. Right. I'm getting ahead. So, okay. With that in place, you guys, so you see what's going on? Everybody sees what's going on? Good, good. All right. So now what we want to do is add automatic selection code. So that okay. means basically if we're going to add anything into our list, there should never be a time when there's not anything selected. And right now, if Logan goes and adds something in, notice how nothing is selected. And if we play it, nothing is selected, so nothing plays. Right. So it would be really nice of it to, to check. And if nothing is selected, go ahead and put a selection in. Right. So that means right after add, we could do a check and say if lb playlist dot item index is negative one, then set it to something. Is equal to what do we want to set it to? Well, in this case, we've just if nothing is selected. We've added a new file. We've just added a file, so that file is going to be the last thing in the list. Right. So that means by selecting the last thing in the list, we'll select what we just added. So we could say LB, and for the last thing, we'll just say what is the, the, the highest item that we can select. So we can right. use the count. So we can use count, but remember, count is total number, and when we deal with the index, it's zero base. So we'll need to take count and minus one. So if we have three things, then the highest item index we could have would be two. So we could take one out. And then everything is even. Perfect. And that should give us something selected always. So we add a song. Song is selected. Nice. Song can be played. And if we add another song, we 
or we're nice to the user in that we leave their selection alone. If they've already been playing a song and they want to continue playing it, then we don't rip that away from them. And remember, we get that with the if by checking that if it's negative one, meaning nothing's selected, then select something. But since something was selected just a second ago after Logan had added the first thing in, we're not going to select anything else. Very nice. All right, so that's automatic selection code. Now we can go ahead and start on our remove code. How do we start getting things out of the list? Well, we'll begin with a general procedure. So that way if we want to have like a key as opposed to a button work, we could do that Exactly. Easily. Have it in multiple places. So we'll call this remove, remove selected. selected. And we don't need to take any information in. Define that, and that's amazingly in the right place. So remove selected. Now, this is very close to what we just touched on in the last app, like the, the remove button. Yeah. Including the old index when we're removing things, because we're going to do the same th same type deal. We're going to remove, and then we're going to reselect something as exactly. close to the original selection as possible. So we need a variable to hold that old selection as old index. And before we delete anything, we'll set old index to be whatever the current selection is. So lb playlist.item index. Now with that remembered we can begin deleting. So we can say lb playlist.items.delete. And use the old index. And turn around and copy paste that line and just change it to lb files. That gets rid of that. And just like before, the... Uh, yeah, we can go ahead and fix the selection stuff now, because we've just deleted uh, both entries out. So, our again, list box are staying in sync. Remember, when we add it, we add it to both at the same time. Now we're deleting from the list boxes. We're deleting from both at the same time. But this is going to... Do we want to show them? It's going to cause a problem with our selection. Right, just, just, like, like, a, with, just like with the previous app. If we take in something, and we'll have two just to make it more clear. So we have two things... One of them selected, and we can't remove it because we didn't link that up yet. Um, yeah, we just need to tie it in real quick. But we're going to have the same problems with uh, Go ahead selection. and tie it in real fast. Just have that call on the remove selected. So get our test case going again with two things. One of them selected, we remove, and then nothing is selected, so we can't play because there's nothing there. So we got to make sure something is still selected, so let's go ahead and fix that real quick. So going back up to the remove selected procedure, the way we were doing that was to say that lb playlist.item index is equal to the old index, but of course that alone wasn't always catching the case if you had a last, or if you deleted the last item, right. that item index no longer exists in the new range, so we have to uh, drop it back by one. So you could say that if old index is greater than playlist.items.count minus one, so that you have the uh, numbering adjusted for the Quite zero based index. In at the end then we'll just yeah. take old index and basically just drop it uh, whatever the basically whatever the count from the playlist is minus one so like that again this was checking to see if it was this is our the uh, items or the count minus one is the highest index we can have right if we're above that then set it to whatever that number would have been just making sure we have the last thing selected so if we re rerun the test and add in two items, select the last one, and remove it, we still have something selected. Beautiful. Okay, fantastic. Coming along. Ready to move on to the next piece? Yep. Okay, it's going to be add the functionality for the simple open button now. Okay, so going back and revisiting this button, because now we've stripped his code away to where he pretty much, as a matter of fact, let me jump into him. He pretty much just opens the dialog and then does nothing. Yeah, and we can leave that old check still in place. So yeah, opening the dialog is fine. Now we need to do something with that. Yeah, and we need to be calling upon good old add procedure. Because <laughs> right above it, here we or have... add procedure, add file. Right? Yeah, here, here we have the new um, add click from that uh, the button we've coded in uh, this video. Mm -hmm. So we can start by copying his code and dropping that in. So after running the open dialog, drop that into the playlists. 
but this is a different button. It would it'd be kind of odd to have this button be a simple duplicate of this one. Right. Instead, we can have this open button, load the file, and then select it, mm-hmm. and then play it all in one button. So it's kind of like an immediate access button, whereas this is a playlist-only button. Exactly. So we've added the file in. Now, we want to do the selection. Even though it might happen, we might get the selected, because if we look over and add file, there's the possibility that it will get selected, but only if nothing is selected. Right. This is opening in a file that's been intentionally opened, so we want to force the selection upon it, regardless of what it was. Now, I can still use similar or even identical code, but I want it without the if check. So I'm going to copy that one piece below it. And whether or not we selected it, ensure that there is a selected item of the one we just added. And we're grabbing the very last one, count minus one. So with it selected, we can do a play item on the selected, and we should have our song playing. So we can say play item lb playlist dot item index. And that has adding the file to the playlist, selecting it, and then finally playing it. Yep, that's it. So let's go ahead and test that out. So open button, song, and don't see anything in the top yet, so I don't think it's... Yeah, I don't see anything. Now what did we miss? We need... Let me think for just a second. Oh, wait a minute. You put all that code in the add... Oh, yeah. yeah. (laughs) Wrong one. There we go. Open click. Perfect. So if we had done open, that would have that would have started it. playing it, and it's playing, and it's and it's everything's working. So that's got our open button reassigned into its new role as an immediate play button. Okay, so now we're really starting to run out of things to do in the playlist. Someone needs to be able to double click on a song. And that, that's yeah, that'd be really doing. convenient because that way you don't have to jump up and down between the select and the uh, the play button. So let's take a look at that. Just like in the test app where we got this guy's on click event, if we look right next to on click, we have on double click. So that seems like it would work fine for us. Mm-hmm. And this can be as simple as play item and give it the selected one. That'll be playlist dot item index. Should be that easy. See so guys how helpful procedures can be. So add a song and then double click the song. There you go. Beautiful. Okay, so now that we have double-clicking in place, um, we've got removing in place. Oh, how about removing with the delete key? Yeah, that sounds good. Just like in that, we had that one edit button where we looked for the VK return to look for enter. Mm -hmm. There's other codes we have, one of them being the delete key. So we could do the same thing in here and say if we have an on key down, there's our key once again. And we could do a check on that key to say that if key is equal to vk delete this time. I'm sure I spelled that wrong. (laughs) There we go. Then, as a matter of fact, we probably don't even need to begin. We can just say remove selected. So now we can add a song in. With it selected, press the delete key on the keyboard and nothing happens because this didn't have focus. That's right, it has to have focus. The good old Windows focus thing strikes once again. So we can have multiple songs, checking. Go ahead, go ahead and add a third song in. Since we're right here at the end, so we've got three songs. Go ahead and hit play on one of those, yeah. And we're playing the right song. Now let's go ahead and delete him out. Okay, now of course, we're still playing and all, and that's fine. All we're doing is manipulating our uh, playlist. Now, this, if you want to make your own player more advanced, here, let me pause this. Okay. If you want to make your own player more advanced, remember when we did the pause check? Mm-hmm. We have other things in there, like playing. Mm-hmm. If you remove something that's playing and you wanted, you could force it onto another song. Absolutely. Now, that all comes down to your own choice as to how you want your MP3 player to work. Like, other softwares will allow you to affect the playlist and not affect what's playing. So, I mean, depending on the package you're trying to replicate, this could be exactly what you want. Exactly. In our case, we're just going to leave it simple right now. They know how to do it if they want to go in here and add this functionality. Right now, we're we're setting it up so that in regards to the playlist, they can go in there and manipulate the playlist and the playing can just continue in the background. So now we see that that works. Let's just go ahead and hit uh, double click or play and drag through that. Beautiful. All right, go ahead and double click on the first one. 
and drag through. And let's delete that one out. Or yeah. to give it focus. And let's go ahead and hit stop. All right, so uh, with that, let's see, do we have a bug here? If you hit play now, well, it's going to take whatever selected. So go ahead and hit play now. That's actually going to work perfect. Uh, we've got everything tied in quite nicely here. So well, really, the only thing left to do is to hide out that box. Let's go ahead and stop that. Let's hide that out so we can call this one. So here at the bottom, visible, false. And I'm going to save all of this out. One last check, and there we go. Okay, beautiful. All right, so guys, there we there we go. We started this video out with the very beginning, the objective being to get a simple grasp on what the list box was. It's just a box that's going to give us a, a list of strings, basically, allow us to go through and select. We can do multi-selects, but it's not set up right now to do that because we don't want that with an MP3 player, and we told you guys we would deal with multi-selects in future applications when they become relevant. Uh, with that, we made a very simple application that allowed us to demonstrate adding information into a list box, removing information from a list box, getting a count of how many things were currently in the list box, showing you how we can go in there and find out who was selected, uh, how to re retrieve the text of the selected individual. We talked about indexes. We talked about item index. Uh, talked about a lot of things, actually. Uh, from there, after we got a simple grasp of working with ListBox, we've moved back over to our simple MP3 player. I hope at this point you guys have a, a better appreciation of why we did the simple player to begin with, because some of you may have struggled a little bit keeping up with all of the jumping around procedures and all that we had to do inside the simple MP3 player to get this new element plugged into our application and get it functioning the way it is now. And if we would have been trying to explain the ListBox at the same time, it could have really complicated matters. Right. Um, with the simple app, depending on your screen res, all that code would probably fit on one screen page. Yeah, so, I no mean, kidding. you can just, you don't have to go look around at things, you can just study it more closely. So, with that, we jumped back into the simple MP3 player and we got the add and remove buttons working for the uh, 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 playlist. We got the simple open working where it would add a file into the playlist and also start playing it as well and make sure it was selected. And we've uh, got play working properly now so that it's going to play whatever is selected in the playlist. We uh, also fixed it so that it would, it would accommodate for a song that is currently paused. And we got double clicking in there to start a song from a playlist. We got the delete key working. Whew. Well, I guess that's pretty much everything we want in this video in regards to the playlist functionality. Of course, in some coming up videos, we're going to be uh, talking about loops and things like that so that we can get in there and start walking through our playlist and do like repeat playlist, shuffle the playlist, then get even more advanced with things like save our playlist, open saved playlists, etc. So that is going to wrap up episode number seven. If it seems a bit confusing, you may need to go back and watch it again. We'd like to thank you guys for joining us for this video, and we'll see if we can get you guys the next episode here real soon. That's going to wrap it up. We'll see you guys.